we might give a, a minute or two uh, before we start talking because people are still joining us. So for the people who are joining us, we're just uh, giving more pe uh, people a few moments so they can join in. We'll start in a second. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to start now. So um, for all of you, I want to say good evening and welcome to, to this webinar. I'm Valis Kalima and I'm a lecturer in politics in DCU. And uh, together with the Immigrants Council, I have been organizing this, this webinar series, which is a part of a research project funded by uh, the Irish Research Council. So this, this project has a very clear objective, which is to, to, to encourage more people from a migrant background <clears throat> to to engage in politics so uh this this third webinar um is focused on um clarify for for uh, people from migrant background um how they can uh, join political parties uh, to understand more about the political context in ireland so it has been uh, uh very interesting in the previous two in the previous two webinars to understand uh what has been the migrants experience on this on this area so um what we're going to do today is to to address some of those issues and uh, hopefully uh more people can can um understand uh more about the political landscape in in ireland and uh so to to clarify for us some of those points uh and to help us to understand a little bit bit about uh the irish politics uh, we have two speakers today. Our first speaker is Adrian Cavanagh, who is a lecturer at the Department of Geography in Manuf University. He lectures in the, in the field of electoral and, um, and political geography and also environmental politics. He was elected president of the, uh, the Geographical Society of Ireland in May 2018 and held this position till May 2020. He then took up uh, the position of vice president of this association until May 2021. And he has an official website where he offers insights from his electoral uh, research. He also researches uh, the Eurovision Song contacts, including uh, the voting patterns and geopolitics. And some of with this, this research has been published on his website. Our second speaker is Claire McGinn. She's a member of the senior management team in IADT, the Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Dunleary, where she has strategic oversight of equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, Claire, she's a social scientist and political geographer. She has published extensively on gender and electoral politics in Ireland. Uh, her recent publications include the Shannon election, voting in unprecedented times, in the book, uh, How Ireland Vote 2020. And a second publication is Women's Political Representation in Dolan, in, in revolutionary, post-revolutionary, Ireland. In the book Women and Irish Revolution, she has also authored several research reports for the National Women's Council of Ireland. So um, with that, I will ask our first speaker, speaker Adrian, to, to start his presentation. He is going to present for about 15 to 20 minutes, and uh, the audience will be able to ask questions. But I will ask, uh, uh, we'll, we'll address these questions after the second presentation. So um, Adrian, I hand over to you. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, okay, I'm just going to share the screen here, hopefully. Oh. Just, I'll just see if I can share the screen here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you um, a hosting right, just a moment, Adrian. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, sorry about that, uh, everyone. I should have said there were, I had a bit of a presentation. Anyway. Uh, so I'm just going to make a few points 
Hello everyone, I'm Adrian Kamna from Minute Geography Department. I'm just going to start with a few general points about uh, our voting system here. So the Irish voting system is a very unusual voting system. It's a form of proportional electoral system. Most people I listen in today, I would presume you're aware of proportional electoral systems, but you're probably more aware of the list proportional electoral system. Uh, the other type of proportional electoral system is what we have in Ireland. It's called the single transferable vote system. So our official, the official name of our electoral system is the proportional representation by single transferable vote. So what does that mean? How is that different? There's uh, differences in terms of basically how many people are elected from each constituency uh, in the Irish system. So in the Irish electoral system, in a country like say the United Kingdom, it's usually just one member of parliament or one councillor per constituency. Ireland has what's called multi-member districts or multi-member constituencies. So that means for general elections, there's three or four or five uh, T members of parliament or as we call them TDs or Chokta Dala elected for each Irish constituency. For local elections, which I think uh, is the type of elections that's of most interest to people here today. For local elections, uh, on average, it's between four to seven seats, which is actually important because the more seats there is in the constituency, the easier it is to win a seat because obviously it makes sense. There's more seats involved. Uh, our electoral system generally tends to be a fair electoral system. We don't have the same domination by two parties that you have in a country like the USA or the United Kingdom, which uses first past the post electoral systems. We do tend to have a lot of coalition governments, whether at the national level in governments or at the local level. So usually councils will, you won't, it's very rare that you get a city council or county council that's dominated by just one party. There's usually some alliance or coalition involved. Small parties or minor parties do have a chance of winning seats in our electoral system whether at the local level or at the national level, but usually only in a small number of areas. So usually a minor party or a smaller party will often win the number of seats in the general election or the local election, but it's usually in, only in areas where that party is especially strong. So if it's a left-wing minor party, you're usually looking at uh, working class urban areas, a party like the Green Party, usually you're looking at middle class urban areas. I like our electoral system. I, I'm biased here in this because there's a lot of fun involved. Uh, there's a lot of fun involved, but there's also a lot of choice involved. Uh, our, as well as that, if you get into Irish elections, you will find there's a lot more drama where our election counts than, say, in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, an, an election ends, elections usually end, at, general elections usually finish the count, the voting stops at 10 o'clock. And usually within a few hours, a lot of constituencies have already produced the results. In Ireland, our election counts last for days. And sometimes if we're lucky, if there's a few recounts, an election count can last for a, a number of days, or if we're really lucky, a number of weeks. Not lucky for the candidates, I should say. Other electoral rules we, in Ireland, we have rules about how electoral boundaries are drawn up. So at the moment we're carrying out, uh, we had our census of population on Sunday night. And in a few months, that census of population is going to lead to a new process of redrawing election boundaries. And because of the increased population in the country, I'm expecting we'll probably have a, a few more seats in for general elections at the next election. I don't know about local elections. There's rules about, and this probably is of interest to everyone here today, there's rules about who can vote in different types of elections. So uh, we have a number of different types of elections in Ireland. The most restricted elections are presidential elections and referendum elections. Only Irish citizens, citizens can vote in those. Uh, general elections or doll elections, Irish and British citizens can vote in those. But if you're a European Union citizen, outside Ireland or Britain, well, Britain's no longer in the EU. Uh, if you're a European Union citizen, if you're living here, if you're resident here, you can vote in European elections and local elections. 
If you're not a European Union citizen, but you're resident here, you can vote in local elections. So local elections are probably are the most open in terms of the types of elections that the most people can vote in. Uh, there's also rules about campaign finance with very strict campaign spending limits. And there's also very strict limits on political donations here. So you won't find that political parties end up winning, getting big donations here because there's rules to stop that. It's not like the USA, for instance. This is a typical Irish ballot paper. So the fun thing about voting in Ireland is you can, it's not a case of just going in and voting for one party or one candidate, you can vote in order of preference. And you can give as many preferences as you like. You can give as many preferences as the number of candidates on the ballot paper. So if there's 27 candidates in the ballot paper, you can vote all the way down from one to 27, or you can just vote for one candidate, or you could vote for say your top five. But the main thing is to make sure there's a clear order of preference. So you see what the Irish ballot paper looks like, a party logo on the left, candidates name and their party with their address details, and then a picture of the candidate and then the box. So if I'm voting number one for the Green Party candidate, Deirdre de Burka, I'll put number one in that box. If my number two is for, say, uh, Kelly of the Labour Party, I'll put a number two in that box. So it's an interesting system. It's fun to vote in. If you like voting, uh, you'll have a lot more time to vote because if there's, say, 35 candidates in the ballot paper, bring in the flask of tea, bring in your sandwiches, you're there for a while when you're picking out your favourite candidates and deciding on the order of preference. So the Irish PRSTB system, we can, it's not just a case of voting for one candidate, you can vote, you're allowed a range of preferences. And you don't have to be tied to one party. So you can vote number one Sinn Féin, number two Fine Gael, number three Fianna Fáil, and then you can vote number four for another Sinn Féin candidate. I've talked about smaller parties being able to win seats in their stronger areas. Uh, but what's really important in this system is the number of seats per constituency. So the bigger the number of seats per constituency, the smaller the number percentage of votes you need to reach what we call the quota. The quota is the number of votes that if you reach that number of votes, you're guaranteed election, you're guaranteed a seat. And the quota is always based around the number of seats in a constituency. So if you can see the wonderful statistics there, you'll see in a three seat constituency, that's the smallest size of constituency we, constituencies we have in general elections, you need to get a quarter of the votes to reach the quota. In a four-seater, you need to get 20%. In a five-seater, 16 and two-thirds percent of the votes. In a six-seater and a seven-seater, the percentage is smaller, but we only use these constituencies for local elections. So it's 14.3% in a six-seater. It's 12.5% of the vote in a seven-seater. So the quota is important. Now, a lot of times candidates will get elected even if they don't reach the quota, but you need to be getting close to the quota at some stage in the count to win a seat in the election. But the bigger the number of seats in the constituency, the better your chance because there's more seats available, but it also means the percentage of the vote you need to reach the quota is decidedly smaller. That's a bit of numbers there on how to calculate the quota. I won't go into that. It's fun for those of us who like numbers but I'm sure you'll be able to catch up that on that later on. Oh, I love those numbers. So voters allowed a range of preferences and we have a series of counts. So in Irish elections, it's not just a case of one count and we name who's elected. So it's not a case if it's a five seater, we have one count and the first five are elected. No, it's, as I said, candidates need to reach the quota to be deemed elected. So on the first count, if one candidate reached the quota, they are deemed elected. Well, we carry on that series of counts until, so if it's a five-seater, we just keep counting until, carrying out counts until five candidates have reached the quota or it gets to the end and there's no other candidates left and the last two candidates who may not reach the quota are deemed elected. So what happens in the count, you have your count, if a candidate reaches the quota, they're deemed elected and their surplus, the extra votes over the quota might be distributed if no candidate is elected on the count, the lowest place candidate or the lowest place candidates are eliminated and their votes are transferred. So we have a series of counts where 
candidates are elected or candidates are eliminated. And these counts keep going until five candidates are deemed elected in the five-seater, four candidates in the four-seater, et cetera, et cetera. I hopefully you get the idea. In Ireland, the voting style is quite local. So voters tend to vote for a local candidate. Now, in a way, what does that mean? It means if you're someone who's been living in the same area for a good period of time, if you've built up connections, if you've built up relationships in that area, you will always have a much better chance of winning a seat than what we call it, what we call in Ireland a blow-in. Someone who's not based in the area, someone who just runs an election. So for instance, if some of you are living in say in the inner city area and you've been living there for five or 10 years, you will have a much better chance of winning a seat in that area than, than I will, irrespective of nationality or ethnicity, because people in that area will know you. Uh, I'll be just looked on as a blowing. People won't know me. So uh, yeah, vote transfers are important. Uh, so when you're going out, if you're a candidate, if you become a candidate and you run in the next local elections in 2024, getting votes is important, but also important try to get high preferences as well, because first preference votes are important to help you win seats, but vote transfers are also important. So high preferences as well. So if you knock on someone's door and ask for a vote and they say, oh, I promised my number one to someone else, try to get a high preference off them as well, because those high preferences could be the difference between you winning a seat or not winning a seat. In the last general election, 21 candidates out of 159 one seats in the basis of transfer. So these were people, for instance, in a five-seater who may have been sixth or seventh on the first preference, sixth or seventh on the first count, but because they, were, they picked up more vote transfers than some of their rivals, they actually ended up taking the fourth or fifth seat in that constituency. So that's a few points about, um, a few points there. sorry, about um, elections. Now, I've just, I don't want to over egg the cake and overdo my time. I just want to say a few points on my research on what I found about uh, immigrant voters in recent elections. So I'll just try to go move on there and share here. I'll move away from Twitter. So I do a lot, I love number crunching. I'm, I, I'm very interested in candidate selection as clear as well. Uh, so I looked at candidate selection trends at the last local elections for uh, immigrant or new Irish candidates. Uh, the trend I found is we got a lot of new Irish or immigrant candidates selected in 2009 after we got this big jump in the number of new Irish or immigrant populations in Ireland in the early 2000s. I think parties thought, oh, look at this big population, there's going to be a knock-on effect in terms of winning seats, but that did not pan out. The last previous local elections in 2014, can parties seem to lose interest? Well, in 2019, a number of political parties once again became very proactive in trying to in select immigrant or new Irish candidates. So the best party in 2019 for selecting immigrant or new Irish candidates was the Green Party. They selected seven, and that was quite a high percentage of their candidates. The next best party was Fine Gael or Fine Gael, followed by Fianna Fáil, and then the Labour Party, People Before Profit, the Social Democrats, and Renewa. And then out of the 53 candidates that ran in the last local elections, who were immigrants, out of the 53 immigrant candidates, just under half of these ran as independents. Now, uh, if I just jump back then uh, to look at, at the results of that election, so how did these candidates do? Uh, just to put it in context, in 2009, just one immigrant candidate won a seat in the local elections or county council elections. In 2014, just two candidates won seats. Uh, that one candidate, by the way, in 2009 was in my home constituency of Port Leash and County Leash, Rotmi Adbury. In 2014, there was only two can successful candidates, Elena Sekis running for Labour in the Limerick City North constituency or East, a uh, double check, and Edmund Lukusu, who ran for Sinn Fein in the Mulhudder constituency. Uh, 
2019 was a much better election for new Irish candidates or immigrant candidates. So eight candidates were successful in that election. And now what, here I'm talking about people who were not born in Ireland. So Hazel Chu wouldn't have been included on this list because she was born in Ireland. So eight candidates were successful in this election, uh, a big increase. Um, and some of them, some of the candidates that were successful were running for the Green Party, some are running for Labour, some are running for Fine Gael, some are running for Fianna Fáil, and there was also a successful uh, People Before Profit candidate. So there was a good mix between the different parties. Sinn Féin did that, funnily enough, Sinn Féin did very well in the general elections, which took place in 2020. The last local elections only took place about eight months before it, but Sinn Féin had very bad local elections. So there weren't that many, uh, Sinn Féin, really didn't do well in terms of getting emigrant candidates elected in 2019. Whereas in 2014, uh, the Shin, there was two candidates elected and one of those was Sinn Féin. Last point before I zip it and hand over back to Valesa and hand over to Claire about turnout. I also look at voter turnout. So what I've, I've been crunching the numbers looking at emigrant turnout rates in Dublin in the last few elections, obviously just looking at local elections. What I've tended to find is registration levels tend to be low. On average, voter turnout levels also tend to be low. But what's interesting, when I just look at the numbers on the supplemented register, so people on the supplemented register would be people who have registered to vote literally in the last few months before an election take play, takes place. Looking at the percentage of percentage turnout rate for emigrant voters who are just on the supplemented register, the turnout level is pretty high. In some cases, it was up to 60, 70 percent. So my suspicion is the low turnout rate for immigrant voters may be, might be a residential mobility effect. The problem being that maybe people go on the register for a certain location, maybe somewhere in the north inner city, they move to another location and they don't remember to register for this new location. And they don't remember to take their name off the register for the place where they were before. So I think there's registration issues uh, involved. And there's also uh, probably, a, a lot of it has to do with residential stability, but the longer people become, are based in an area, the longer they live in an area, my research tends to find that they're more likely to be voting, they're more likely to be registering, and also they're more likely to be putting themselves forward as candidates. So thank you everyone for your time. I'll hand back to Vanessa and over to Claire. Uh, thank you very much, Adrian. That was uh, a lot of uh, very relevant information. So that was very good to know, uh, for example, that um, after the census, after the results of the census are out, uh, maybe there will be uh, more seats so not necessarily at the local level, but at some point it might happen. So uh, it was also very interesting to learn about uh, the complexity of the Irish voting system. Uh, it can be a little bit daunting at first, but it has an analogic to it. So it's very important that um, future candidates understand how, how the system works. So um, with that, I will hand over now to Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Great, thanks, Valeska. And uh, Adrian is a very hard act to follow always, but I'll try my best. Um, I'm not going to use slides. Um, I'm just going to talk you through some, uh, some points. And my brief, I suppose I was asked um, when I was invited to come along, was to talk about the socio-cultural context behind the Irish political party system. And this can be quite daunting initially um, for the very reasons that Adrian has outlined. Um, we have a multi-party system in Ireland. Um, our electoral system, I suppose, encourages um, a number of parties um, uh, to, to, to run for office, but, but importantly, to, to secure representation at all levels of government. And that can be quite daunting and confusing. Um, and certainly there is research, including really groundbreaking research by Valeska herself in recent years, to show that this can be a barrier 
barrier to migrants and to other underrepresented groups from running for office. So I think it's really important um, that we, you know, that we start to maybe break down and distill some of the main, um, uh, some, some of the key cha um, uh, ideologies and goals and histories of the different political parties. So you'll get a context of where you might best fit or what party might be best for you uh, to consider as an option if you're thinking of running for election. And I hope you all are and do. Um, just to say that there are a number of older political parties in Ireland which can trace their development back to the, to the establishment of the Irish Free State um, and even before it. Um, historically, there was what was called an, a two and a half party system. This would have consisted of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael as the main electoral players in Irish politics and then the Labour Party being the other and um, the third party, as, as you will, in the system with other minor parties coming and going throughout Irish electoral history. In more recent years, though, we have seen a number of newer parties emerge and they have uh, secured a significant representation levels uh, at all uh, levels of, of politics. Um, I'm going to talk you through some of the main parties in, in, in Irish politics at present um, and all of those who have representation at present in Dáil Éireann. And also then when I'm finished, I will set, share some links with you um, of the main political parties' websites and importantly, the sections of their websites where they talk about their values and their ideologies and who they are uh, and their policy platforms. Because I think that's probably really useful for you to know if you're, I suppose, um, in the market for looking for, for, for a party to join and to run for. Um, I'll start with Fianna Fáil, as I said, because Fianna Fáil has historically been the, the, the main uh, political player in Irish political life, really up until the 2011 general election. Um, Fianna Fáil owes its, its, its establishment or its foundations um, to a split in Irish, in Irish politics um, when the Anglo-Irish Treaty was published in 1921. And the Anglo-Irish Treaty, for those of you who may not be aware, was the document um, that essentially established the Irish Free State following the War of Independence with, with Britain. And there was a split in the, in, the, in the political system as a result of this treaty. Um, a number of people were, were pro-treaty um, and they would got, go on to, be, to form what was called Cumann Gael or later essentially merged into Fine Gael. And I'll talk about those in a minute. They were the pro-treaty side. And then the anti-treaty side, um, a, ma a many of them would later go on to, to establish a party called Fianna Fáil in 1926 under Eamon de Valera's leadership. Um, Fianna Fáil is, describes itself as a centrist Christian democratic party and historically it, 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 it appealed to all social divides and all classes in Irish society. Um, that was the kind of the, 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 their aim initially and certainly it did work very well for them for many, many decades. It has changed slightly now and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Fianna Fáil dominated Irish politics for most of the post-World War II period. Um, so from the formation of the first Fianna Fáil government in 1932 until the 2011 general election the party was in power for 61 of 79 years so it really was the really dominant force in Irish society for many long um, and its longest continuous period of office was 15 years and 11 months from 1932 to 1948 where Fianna Fáil uh, was in uh, government at that time. The party suffered a pretty catastrophic defeat in 2011 um, after many voters, uh, you know, this was the, I suppose, the, the, during the, the very severe global recession and the party would have been blamed but by many voters, I suppose, for, for economic management, both before and during the early years of the economic crisis. Um, and Fianna Fáil and Labour took over uh, at that particular point. Um, in the 2016 election, the party formed what was called a confidence and support supply arrangement with independence to support the to support the Fine Gael led government and what that meant was that Fianna Fáil um, agreed to support Fine Gael on key votes um, to ensure that they had the numbers to, for stability in government at that time F the, the Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael um, would have been quite concerned as with all parties were quite concerned about Brexit and they saw it I suppose as their duty at this time to um, to give some stability to the country to get us out of that particular uh, difficult period. 
Um, but Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael had dominated Irish politics since the 1930s, but they had never formed a formal coalition up to that point. Um, that changed um, after the 2020 general election, where Fianna Fáil um, became the largest party in the Dáil by just one seat. Um, so with 38 seats to Sinn Féin's 37. Um, and they are currently in a formal coalition arrangement with Fianna Gael and with the Green Party. And they have what's called a rotating Taoiseach arrangement. So uh, um, um, Taoiseach, Bra Leo Varadkar, uh, Fianna Gael leader, um, was, was previously Taoiseach. We've currently got Taoiseach Micheál Martin, leader of Fianna Fáil. And later this year, that will rotate back um, to, to Fianna Gael um, under uh, 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 leader, um, deputy, uh, or minister, um, uh, uh, Leo Varadkar. Um, at the moment, Fianna Fáil is the largest party in local government. It holds 279 seats of 949, or just under 30%, and that compares to Fine Gael's 255 seats. And since January 2019, the party has had a partnership with the Nationalist Party, the Social Democratic and Labour Party, or what's most commonly known as the acronym, the SDLP, in Northern Ireland. Another thing I think it might be interesting for you to note is that all Irish parties who have representation in the European Parliament are also members of much bigger European party groupings in the Parliament. And Fianna Fáil is a, is a member of what is called Renew Europe, uh, what was formerly known as ALDI um, uh, in, in Parliament. So that's Fianna Fáil for um, a, a quick uh, summary or a quick tour of Fianna Fáil. Um, Fine Gael, as I've mentioned, also owes its origins to that split as a result of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which, which saw the establishment of the Irish Free State. Um, and at this time, uh, Cumann uh, was 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 the party where uh, pro-treaty uh, deputies and, and voters um, tended to, to, to go to rally um, around. Um, uh, Fine Gael itself was founded in 1933 following a merger with Cumann Gael and two other um, movements or associations, the National Centre Party, which was a smaller centrist party, and the Army Comrades Association or the ACA. Michael Collins is linked to the party uh, as Michael Collins was a founding member of Cumann Um, and I suppose historically in Ireland and this would continue to this day there is a little bit of rivalry I suppose between the Eamon de Valera camp and the Michael Collins camp in Irish politics um, and we still see this play out actually even in youth organisations in political parties. Um, like Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael it also describes itself as a centrist political party, um, a Christian Democrat party, though it has never had the same catch-all appeal as Fianna Fáil um, has had. It, it, its support has always tended to be that little bit more uh, middle class um, and slightly more urbanised um, than Fianna Fáil. Um, it's currently the la third largest party in Ireland um, in terms of membership of Dáil Éireann. Um, it's the second largest in local government following the 2019 local elections. And it is the largest in terms of the number of members of the European Parliament um, from Ireland at, at present. Um, as I've mentioned, Fianna Fáil was the dominant electoral player in Irish politics for much of the 20th century. However, Fine Gael did enter into a number of, of, of coalition governments uh, during the century, with Labour being their dominant coalition partner. And actually, for that reason, historically speaking, in terms of transfers, we did tend to see, uh, a, in terms of going back to what Adrian spoke about with transfers in, in voting, we did see Labour um, uh, often get the the second or third transfer uh, from Fine Gael voters. So once they had voted for Fine Gael, they would often transfer to Labour, given that historical relationship between the two parties. Though ideologically speaking, um, there would be a, a number of differences. Um, it entered into a coalition government with Fine Gael in 2011. That was a groundbreaking election for the party. Um, and it's a member um, of the of the EEP uh, in Europe, um, the European People's Party uh, in, in Europe. Um, 
To move on to Sinn Féin, um, I suppose, um, as I said, the second largest party in the Dáil at the moment. Um, Sinn Féin describes itself as a left-leaning and Republican party, um, uh, of course, would, you know, would have, uh, uh, and is a cross-island party too, organises about the North and the South, and it has historic, historic links to the Irish Republican um, army. Um, 2020 was a really significant um, election for Sinn Féin, and it saw it, its number of seats jump uh, up to 37, um, which I don't think anybody predicted, even the party themselves, given the, the number of candidates they ran, they could have run significantly more candidates um, and, and won, took, took a la much larger number of seats. Um, the party has traditionally appealed to Republicans, um, so those who are... Uh, um, rally around uh, United Ireland um, and to those in lower income areas, particularly in Dublin. But that has changed in more recent years and the party now has a much broader appeal across all of, of all of Irish society. I mean, in 2020, it won just under 27% of the first preference votes, more than any other parties. But because it didn't run enough candidates, it wasn't able to capitalise um, on that vote. It did suffer a, a, a quite a significant defeat in the local elections in 2019, um, and though it had won 159 local election seats in, in 2014, that dropped to 84 seats in 2019. And that's really interesting given how well they performed in the general election uh, only months later, a matter of months later, um, and, and there's some unpacking there. Um, but it does mean that at a local level, they don't have a strong base as they probably would like to have, but they will are, are absolutely going to have a very, very good local election in 2024 as things stand. Um, in Europe, they are a member of what is called the European uh, uh, Europe Unit, Un United Left or the Nordic Green Left. Um, the Labour Party is a social democratic party. It's um, Ireland's oldest uh, political party at present, founded in 1912 as part of the trade union movement. So it would still be seen as the arm of the political arm of the trade union and labour movements in Ireland. And so it has very or, uh, maintains its organisational links with that movement. And it describes itself as a democratic socialist party in its constitution and has led out on a number of key social reforms in, in the Irish political context. Um, as I've mentioned, in 2011, it became the second largest party in the Dáil, but it slipped to fourth place in 2016 um, after it suffered a very bad defeat um, in, in that general election after being the junior coalition partner with Fine Gael. Um, so it lost, it went from having 37 seats to seven seats in one uh, election. Um, it currently holds six seats um, in the Dáil um, and um, also has a number of senators um, elected um, as well. In Europe, it sits with the party of the European Socialists. And so I think that knowing where the party sit in a European context will also give you a good understanding of their ideology. Um, to move on to quickly to the Green Party, so the Green Party, as the name suggests, is a green political party. It is also a cross-island party. Um, it operates both north and south. Um, and like other like-minded green parties across Europe, it has what might be seen as a more eco-socialist green left wing and also a more moderate or pragmatic faction, faction as well. And that would be the case across a number of European green parties. Um, it was founded initially in 1981 and was called at that time the Ecology Party um, of Ireland. It first entered the Dáil in 1989, and it has partnered in Irish government twice, um, at the first time in 2007 to 2011 as a junior partner in a coalition government with Fianna Fáil, um, and it lost all of its seats in the 2011 general election following um, the global economic crisis. And as I said, Fianna Fáil also had a very poor election. Um, and since 2020, as I've mentioned, it has been in coalition government with Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. Uh, 
um, it doesn't, it's not part of the rotating Taoiseach arrangement. Uh, that was with Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, but the party does have a number um, of, um, of ministers uh, in cabinet and junior ministers, um, including a senator, which is quite, quite significant, uh, wouldn't be very usual or very, uh, very uh, common. Um, and it also, um, so the, the Taoiseach is able to appoint 11 members to the Shannons. And as part of that arrangement, the Green Party also got a number of seats uh, from that. At local government level at the moment, it had a very good local election in 2019. So it won 40 49 seats. So that, in, that was a numeric increase of 37 seats relative to the previous general or the previous local election, which was which was uh, a, a monumental for them. And in Europe, it sits with the European Greens or the European Freedom Alliance. You will also have heard, I'm sure, uh, talk about the Social Democrats, and they would be very similar ideologically to the Labour Party. In actual fact, two of their founder members are former members of the, the Labour Party. Um, they are a centre-left Social Democratic Party, and they would very strongly promote the Nordic model of social democracy. In 2019, um, they secured 19 local election seats. Um, and in the 2020 election, they ran 20 candidates and 20 constituencies um, and increased their vote share from two to six, despite a small fall in the number of first preference votes um, that, that they received. Um, People for Profit, Solidarity is a left-wing electoral alliance in the Republic of Ireland. Um, uh, again, they also organise in the in, in the North, but not as a single electoral alliance. They are split in the North at this time. Um, they are socialist political parties. Um, that would be how they would describe themselves. In the Dáil, in the 2020 general election, they won 50 of 60 seats. And in local the local elections 2019, they had a, they won 11 and seats. Um, like the Social Democrats, PBP Solidarity has never entered a coalition government um, at this stage. The final party I want to mention, and then I'm happy to take any questions, um, is to talk about AIM2. So AIM2 is another all-Ireland political party. It was formally launched in 2019, and again, it operates in the North and the South. Ideologically, AIM2 is a socially conservative party, um, and it advocates for a united Ireland and for centre-left economics, um, is how it describes itself. And it's currently led by Padder Tobin. Um, they have one Dáil seat, and in the, the, um, they also contested um, the local government um, elections in 2019 and secured some representation there. The last thing I just want to, to point you out, to point to, is the fact that outside of political parties, independent candidates have been a really prominent feature of Irish political life. Um, and they're also becoming increasingly organised as a bloc in a way that we hadn't seen previously. Um, they currently account for just under one fifth of all local councillors in Ireland. I do think it's important to say, though, that it's very hard to, to kind of create a typology of independence, that independents come from all political or backgrounds or none, um, and they have very various ideologies and viewpoints across the, the political um, spectrum. But I do think it's important um, to, to, to note this. And also, there has been a number of migrant and new Irish candidates who have contested uh, um, uh, elections, and particularly local elections, um, as independents. So I will leave it there. And that's my whistle stop tour of the Irish political system. And as I say, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Claire, thank you very much. Uh, that was very enlightening. I'm really amazed uh, how you could uh, just summarize 100 years <laughs> of Irish electoral history. Uh, and, um, and, and also thank you for clarifying uh, those differences because they are very nuanced sometimes. So it's understandable why um, it can be difficult for um, a person from a migrant background to select a party that would fit uh, their values. So thank you a lot for that. Uh, there is a whole conversation <laughs> going on here in the chat, which is great. But I have, uh, I'm taking note of, uh, of some of the questions I have seen so far. So the first one is a question that we were already expecting, which uh, was made by uh, Memona, who was asking uh, which party is more open to, uh, to minorities. And, uh, and this person also made a second question related to that. So how can candidates be successful when they join a political party? 
Uh, would you want to comment on that first, Adrian? Yeah, some really interesting, I'm, tr I'm typing away, trying to answer questions at the moment. Um, <laughs> yeah, which party was the most open in 2019? It was clearly the Green Party. I think in terms of the party where candidates were the most successful, I think Claire might correct me on this, but I think actually Fine Gael were slightly the more successful. But out of eight candidates in total is kind of, uh, we're talking hairs in your head there. But uh, yeah, the Greens were very good in terms of selecting well, very good, we're talking still low numbers. How to be successful? I was just typing this, just typed this in the comments. For local elections, to be a successful candidate, it's about becoming established in a local area. Uh, one of the people in the comments actually put this a lot better than me. Uh, I'm just trying if I can read back there. Uh, Arjumand, was it? Or it's about kind of, yeah, it comes down to networks you build. People tend to vote for those to, for whom they know very well. So the key to winning an election, especially local elections, which I think many applies to the group here, it's about becoming established in your local communities. As was said there, building connections, getting involved in community organizations and becoming known. If you're known in the area, political parties are probably more likely to encourage you to put yourself forward to run for elections, but you're also better people, local people, are more like, likely to vote for you. And really, when it boils down to it, Irish elections, I should have said this earlier, they're very candidates centered. So if local people know you, if local people like you, they will vote for you at the local elections. And it doesn't really fully boil down to ethnicity. If you were, as I said in my own talk earlier on, uh, if one of you came from the inner city and you'd a really strong connection with the local area, and I decided I'd run in the same area and I'm from Leash, you would wipe the floor at me in the local elections. Claire? Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I might come in around, um, so in terms of, you know, kind of becoming a candidate and the best way to do it, I think that was the question of us, wasn't it? Um, but I was involved with a piece of work about three years ago with, 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 with former colleagues of myself and Valeska and a current colleague of Adrian, Dr. Pauline Cullen in sociology in Maynooth. And we surveyed all local councillors in 2019. Um, th th they'd just been elected. And we actually asked them what routes they had taken to, to become candidates. And what we found was that I'm totally, I totally agree with Adrian 100% that being active in your community is absolutely fundamental, being seen, being visible, I think all of that helps. But another area we don't talk about as much is the role that party membership plays in becoming a candidate. And the vast majority of candidates in office who, who run for who run the, who run for public office, and particularly at local levels, our research showed, are members of political parties. But not only that, they were active in their political parties. Um, that you know, and I suppose that was kind of their launch pad in many cases to to becoming candidates to, and to having those networks for canvassing, for postering, for support. Um, so so if I was going to give anyone a piece of advice, I would say that if you are interested in running and interested in running for a political party and um, get involved with that party in, in as much as you can and look we all have other care uh, other you know other barriers and um, to, to, to participate to active participation but I would say that is really important that we we did and uh, we, we found it um, and I suppose there's many ways you can get involved in your political party in a political party you know it, it's not always about being the chair you know of, of the branch or the constituency there are a number of other roles um, you know the secretary I would say has a lot of power um, a lot of soft and hard power I would say in parties you you know, there's roles like the treasurer, the PRO. Um, Valeska might correct me on this, but I think a couple of parties do have equality and diversity people at local and constituency level. So mm. whatever you're interested in, um, you know, there may be a space, there, you know, there will be a space for you. And I can also say too, and I don't know if we've parties on the call, but I, I say this quite uh, frankly, I don't think parties are ever going to turn down anybody who wants to get involved. Um, so that would be my, just a piece, another piece of advice I'd give anyway. One. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, there is one comment that was made, I think, already here in the chat, which I'm going to transform in a question because I think this is a good one. Um, Lazan was, was asking or just comment on the barriers that migrants face uh, to, to engage in politics, to 
join political parties. So what do you think um, someone that has, uh, 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 that has went to run for elections, uh, should they go and look for a party or should they actually wait and see which party tries to, to involve them, to engage them? What would be the best strategy? I think, uh, Claire, you mentioned uh, being shopping around for a party. I think uh, this is a good way to put because I think it's important to know what's out there because there is a connection between success and having party membership. It matters a lot. So what should this person do? I mean, I don't know with age agree with me, but I would be of the opinion around shopping around. I think um, the thing about parties is they, they tend to be inherently conservative in terms of the type of candidate they look for. So they are at one, I suppose, trying to diversify their pools as, as they should. And, um, and yet I'm not so convinced that they have fully strategized actually doing this. So I think that the easier you make it for them, the better, to be honest. Um, so I, I would say absolutely. So, you know, if there's somebody on this call who really wants to run for office, and again, I, I absolutely plead and I would encourage everybody on this call to run because we need you. We need you. Absolutely. Um, but, um, you know, if, if you are interested and you're coming from this cold, I would take a look at all of those political party websites. I would have a really just you know have a think you know have a look at what clo most closely aligns with your values um all of the political parties now have equality and diversity officers um so there are people you can reach out to or your local councillor or your local td i'm sure could make those connections for you um and you know parties will be very happy to, to speak to you um i've seen adrian has put in the chat too and i might let adrian come into this about going to the party you think is best place to win a seat adrian i might let you come in on the pragmatic yeah, being pragmatic, uh, and I see Bart asked a question along the same lines, what's the recipe for a successful candidate in local elections, running independent or under the party flag? So I think Claire and myself are in agreement, and the, the data from 2019 suggests that being in a political party increases your chances of winning a seat. Um, gosh, I forgot that I was transferring Bart's question, so... Yeah, shopping around for parties, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Uh, and, oh yeah, being pragmatic, which party, uh, yeah, which party do you think would be most likely to help you win a seat? Uh, there's different, there's ways to be pragmatic. Uh, you could think about running for the party. The party that's most likely to pick up the biggest number of seats at the next local elections. And even at this stage, we're, what, what year are we in now? Sorry, 2022. We're still over two years away from the next local elections, but even at that stage, for two reasons, the swing to Sinn Féin, but also the fact that Sinn Féin actually did very badly in the last local elections. So I think Sinn Féin's going to win a lot, gain a lot of seats at the next local election. So one, being pragmatic, you could go down the Sinn Féin route. Being pragmatic, I'd also suggest maybe give, especially if you're in a rural area or a kind of a, a larger rural area, Maybe give some consideration to not just Sinn Féin, but maybe Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, the larger parties, because they tend to run more candidates. So you might be more likely to be put forward to run by those parties because they say, OK, we're going to run three candidates here. And they're, more, they're probably more open to uh, running new candidates than maybe some of the smaller parties are. But then again, you could also be pragmatic on the fact that, well, you look at the numbers, Green Party are very open to running immigrant candidates. Uh, and also other parties like Labour, so the, the, the smaller left-wing parties as well. So I've tried to be pragmatic, but I basically said that <laughs> any of the parties would be good. Uh, but um, on the whole, Sinn Féin's going to pick up a lot of seats next time. So maybe you could pick up in the Sinn Féin surge and get on that train. I can just to just to look at the independent route. So as Adrian correctly says, I mean political parties are key, particularly for underrepresented groups. But having said that, the independent route allows you much more flexibility and I would say creativity around the type of candidate you want to be and the type of message you want to sell. You know, you're not as constrained by a party message. Um, so you know, I think for people who are very active in their community, mm. I wouldn't rule out the independent route either. Um, now there are more challenges.
challenges to being an independent candidate you can rely let you don't have the party backing of course um but but having said that not political party candidates don't always have a huge amount of backing from parties either and a lot of them do tend to rely as my own work with pauline adrian's work and valessa's work has shown a lot of candidates do end up tending to go with their own personal networks even if they're members of parties um mm. so um so i wouldn't rule that out either as an option yeah i think over time the independent route will become a really good route yeah. as well so yeah claire's right there yeah, and I think this route is a valid one, especially because uh, for migrants, it has been uh, uh, their choice in the majority of the case for um, uh, several reasons that we have already uh, mentioned here. So there is uh, another question here from from um, uh, Memona, and I think this is a good one too. So I'm not sure if you know the answers for that one, but uh, try uh, perhaps make a comment. So. Um, uh, in local election, does the ethnic or religious background of the candidate affect voters' support for these candidates? So basically, uh, uh, would in which way uh, possible voters would would uh, deal or treat these people in a in a, um, uh, in a different way? Have you seen something in your research? Have you uh, comment about it? I think it does, and it doesn't, Vanessa. Uh, I think if you're say, we'll just say a Lithuanian someone who was born in Lithuania and you're running in an area where a large, very large cluster of other Irish Lithuanians live in that area, that gives you an advantage. I think the numbers suggest that looking at the immigrant candidates who made it over the line uh, in 2019, there was no specific nationality that was overrepresented there. So I think it again boils down, it's, I'm, we're, going, we're starting to repeat ourselves, he, ourselves here, but Irrespective of your ethnicity or religion, I think if you've made the local connections in your area, really ethnicity doesn't matter. And as I said my, about myself, I think if any of the attend, of participants here decide to run as a candidate in their area, and I decide, oh, I'm going to run in Sligo or I'm going to run in Loud, uh, anyone here is going to do better than me in that area because I'll be a blow in. I've no local connections there. But if you built up the local connections, I think it it balances things out. Uh, yeah, I think it, so. It does and it doesn't would be my very clear answer here. Sorry. I mean, I might come in too. I suppose to say that I suppose it's important we recognise too that you know candidates from underrepresented backgrounds, ethnic and racial backgrounds, have experienced racism on the campaign trail too. Um, so I know your work, Valeska, my my work, and others have shown that you know there have been, and particularly not but not exclusively for female candidates from minority backgrounds, they have experienced kind of the duality of sexism and racism on the campaign. Um, and that I suppose it's more to recognise that, that that reality. And I do I do think there is a lot of work to be done by political parties to, to, to better support their candidates who, who are going through that. Um, now, I'm aware of some other, some kind of work that's ongoing in, in this space. Um, you know, I'm just thinking of one particular example is around online uh, politics and, and what people have experienced online. And we do know from research in the UK, unfortunately, that candidates from ethnic minority backgrounds do experience, you know, higher levels of abuse. And that is very racialized and for women, highly sexualized as well. So I think it's unfortunate and I wish it wasn't the case and I hope it'll change, but I just think it's important that we recognise that as well. Um, all the more reason for more people to run. Um, for more diversity in politics, um, you know, is, is a good thing for absolutely everybody and, and um, to be pushing. And I think it's really incumbent on those of us working in this field, people like myself and Adrian Valeska and the immigrants and others, that we continuously, you know, that we're not only encouraging people to run, and we are, but that we're also working and pushing and advocating for supports for these people when they do run. I know Adrian would support me on that one yeah, as well. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, we will speak about uh, some of those issues in the webinar number two. So I do uh, suggest people to have a look if you want to uh, learn a little bit more about it. I will take just one final question and uh, it's from uh, Liliana. She is asking, what do you think of the electoral campaign donation uh, legislation who kept donations to run a political campaign to 1000 euros? So I think this is a this is uh, the regulation at the moment. So you have to to do everything with only 1,000, I think, per donation. Do you have a comment on how to deal with it? It's it, it, it's low, right? It's yeah, I, in, in Ireland, uh, 
campaign donations aren't a big thing. Uh, in Ireland, I, I t- definitely for at the national level, I think the political parties are very dependent on state funding. So with very strict rules, even before this comes in, there's actually pretty strict rules on campaign donations, but there's also strict rules on the amount of money a candidate can spend at election time. So it's a very different electoral system than to say, if you look at a very extreme case to United States of America, like uh, it does balance things out. But again, even with this, you will find that some parties are better resourced than others and some candidates will be better resourced. But there is an attempt at least made to try to level the playing field so that people aren't simply buying the election because they're so well resourced. Attitude totally. I think any kind of restrictions on private donations into parties and you know, in any way of money kind of influencing elections can only be a good thing. Having said that, I do take the point that it can be quite restrictive on candidates. And I've spoken to candidates who um who have made this very point to me, but I'm on the balance of saying it's it's a good thing and a positive thing. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. So um I think I'm going to conclude now. The last thing I want to ask you is um, if you were going to give uh, any kind of advice for a person from a migrant uh, a background that is planning to run for election, um, what would you say to them? I would say uh, that the, the local elections are, are two and a half years away. It's not that long of a time, and yet it, it is a nice period of time. If you are thinking about running, and again, I want to encourage you to do it, that start this process now, I would say, and have that longer lead in time, whether that's joining a party, whether that's a, that's in your party, whether or not it's, 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 it's looking for that nomination, but start that work now, I would say, in, insofar as you can. Yeah, and I won't disagree with Claire in that it's it is quite a long run into next local elections, everyone. So there is time to build up, not just uh, your own kind of connections with potentially with a political party or maybe you'll run as independents. But uh, if you've been living in an area for a long period of time, my argument is you've built up connections. You know the local community irrespective of nationality, you have as good a chance of winning a seat, in my view, as another local person. Or definitely, you have a much better chance of someone who's not local to the area. So, uh, yeah, there, players know the challenges that you face. It's not, elections are a tough game. I would never dream of running an election myself, but uh, if it's something you're interested in doing, if you are interested in being a local representative, yeah, there is, like... The numbers of new Irish immigrant candidates who are getting elected went up from two in 2014 to eight this time around. So next time around, if that trend continues, we could be up to 32 or even better. Uh, as time goes on, you're going to find uh, the country's political parties are more open to getting immigrant candidates involved. Uh, the country's going to be more open to electing immigrant candidates. But I think on the other hand, as people become more and more settled in areas, it's much more easier for you to not just run in elections, but also, let's not forget, uh, the process of registering to vote and turning out to vote, that factor as well is also very important. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you everyone for this enlightening discussion. Um, I want to thank our panelists, Claire and Adrian, and also I want to thank uh, uh, Teresa and Liliana from the uh, the Immigrants Council. So our next webinar in the series is is the final one, and this one is about running um, an electoral campaign. Uh, sorry, campaign uh, online and offline. So this is going to take place on the twentieth of April um, at six pm. So I think uh, the link it should be there in the chat, but if not, it's uh, on the Immigrants Council website. So thank you very much. Have a good evening and I hope to see you all soon. Take care. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.